Welcome everyone. Thanks for participating with us today in our webinar entitled Choosing and Implementing Dyslexia Intervention Programs in the Classroom. I'm Michael Hart and I'm very pleased to have my colleague Ty Hodak with me here today. Ty is the Director of Instructional Programming for the Tennessee Department of Education and she's got very deep dish knowledge and background with regard to uh, this type of process in the classroom. So we're really super lucky to have her here today. So good morning, Ty. Good morning, everyone. Would you like to add anything? You want to tell a little bit about your biography? Uh, sure. Um, so I moved to Tennessee from Michigan. I spent um, several years in the public school system serving in many different roles, um, reading coach, school psychologist, RTI coordinator, um, and then moved to the state of Tennessee, worked in a district for about four years, um, serving um, really roles around RTI, and then um, began working at the State Department in 2012, So, um, and have worked to implement tiered systems of support in our state for the past three years, um, and have developed lots of training, got to work with lots of teachers, have had the privilege of working with administrators, and really um, just trying to make a difference for students in Tennessee to be better prepared. Um, so through the RTI process and through our special education framework and our focus in Tennessee and making special ed the most intensive intervention on a continuum. Um, so I, I've really been able to um, work to improve instructional practices for students and it's been um, a very great opportunity. Cool, cool. Thank you very much for that. I was, as you, people who know me know that I always like to start with a uh, roadmap. So we're going to uh, briefly discuss what we're going to cover today. We've got a lot of ground to cover, uh, but please understand that this is being recorded so that um, we're going to be able to provide you a lot of content this, uh, right now and then you're going to be able to go back and listen to it and, and read it again anytime it's most convenient for you. So one of the things, one of the main topics we're going to talk about is the importance of understanding the literacy and math skills trajectories or the developmental processes that a child goes through or a student goes through as they develop their literacy skills and their math skills. And that's going to be super important because the more clearly and the more specifically we can map where a child is in the trajectory, the more specific we can be with regard to where we can intervene as needed. Now from a pragmatic perspective, I think one of the most important things we're going to be able to provide for you today is a step-by-step -step model that Ty and her team developed specifically for assessing intervention products because we know that there's a broad range of people that are listening and some of you are going to be just in the very beginning part of that process. Some of you may be in the middle. You may be doing things already in your schools and your districts and we want to make sure that we give you a very clear-cut model for understanding how you can assess what's most effective for you. Then we're going to uh, we're going to ask Todd to review some actual programs that she is deeply uh, uh, kind of um, aware of and knows a lot about so that you can kind of help you think through some of those things, those issues with regard to those particular programs. And then of course um, we want to spend I kind of think it's implicit in what we're doing today that we want to go from just providing you impl information to being able to make sure that you feel like when you walk away, you've got some real nuts and bolts, practical understanding of how to deal with the implement Im implementation process and whatever challenges that may come uh, uh, arise during that process. And it is a process. Finally, we would like to give the opportunity to ask us questions. So at the end, we're going to do a live audience Q&A, and our producer, Christy, is going to feed Ty and I the questions that you provide us during the course of this presentation, and we'll make every effort to answer as many of those questions as possible. Now, we also have uh, a rich trove of resources for you that we'll review very quickly before we finish up after we have the live Q&A. So please be sure to hang around for that so that you um, derive the value from the many things that uh, Ty has been able to put together for us today. So this is where I hand it off to Ty. Um, let me just make a uh, kind of a overview statement. Uh, we know that we've got a couple of our listeners are actually 
uh, out of from out of the United States. We know I've got I've got some real friends in Australia and some other countries in the world, but I wanted to talk about response to uh, inter, inter, excuse me response to inter, instruction and intervention related to what we're doing in the United States. And this is something where Thai is a, a significant national expert. So I wanted to get out of the way for a few minutes and ask Ty to talk about what it means to use RTI and how to do that most effectively. Sure. So I'm going to provide just a little bit of an overview. So for those of you on um, the call that attended the last webinar, or if you want more detail on this webinar, then you can um, uh, sign up for the webinar we provided before this one. Um, but just kind of an, a general overview. Um, in the state of Tennessee, we chose to go with a framework around response to instruction and intervention. Now, nationally, there's a response to instruction framework. But when we began looking at our process, we determined we wanted the focus to also be on instruction, actually the primary focus to be on instruction, and then intervention to follow. So basically, response to instruction intervention at a national and Tennessee specific um, level is, is a multi-tiered system of supports. So you have your tier one, your instruction for all students um, and in our state, um, the you know, Tennessee state standards and other states it would be considered the common core and some other states is their specific standards, but tier one is the standards, the, the outcomes that all students should have when they leave that grade level, what the teachers should be teaching at uh, specific grade levels, um, standards related to that grade. And our approach is that all students in the state of Tennessee have access to high quality instruction, that's that tier one. Tier two is in addition to core instruction. Um, those are for those students who have some deficits or fall below the 25th percentile in skill deficit areas, which if you have a well-oiled machine is around 10 to 15 percent of your population that needs tier two intervention in addition to core instruction. Um, for some of those students that tier two is not intensive enough or for some of those students that fall below the 10th percentile and require a more intensive intervention from the get-go. Um, tier three is more defined more explicit and more targeted to that individual student um, and more intensive than tier two and still in addition to core instruction. Um, I think an important fact here is it doesn't go tier one, tier two, tier three like some would think. It's tier one core instruction plus an intensive intervention. Um, tier two or tier three, depending on the level of intensity. In our state, we've really focused on, in the light gray you'll see above those guiding principles, we have worked a lot with leadership. We actually targeted leadership first when it came to response to instruction and intervention because we knew in order to get buy-in to be able to defend the define an at-risk student, to be able to approach a tiered process to help students, we needed to target our leadership in the state and really hold them accountable to the results for students in their districts, and not just specific students, but all students. Um, We've really focused on a culture of collaboration in our state, um, really tearing down those silos between general education and special education. We really had to stop that um, flow of all students needing special education support and instead determine on the continuum what was necessary for each student. Um, and then we believe in prevention and early intervention, and we put a lot of our stock into the prevention and early intervention phases. Although all students um, deserve intervention in their area of need, K-12, um, we really are focused heavily on trying to get it right in those elementary years and then providing intensive supports for students at the secondary level as well. Okay. So we really wanted to kind of give an overview of that piece so that it kind of builds on the rest of this information um, and, and so we can help support you to understand. First, you need a multi-tiered system of support put in place that teachers understand and have knowledge of so that we can uh, implement effectively within the buildings. And you did it in a way so that the teachers feel supported as opposed to another top-down mandate. Sure. I mean, a lot of schools were already doing this and doing it well. So we really tried to replicate those schools um, and districts that were doing it well and maybe tweak their system a little bit to be more evidence-based or um, improve their outcomes a little more. But we've provided significant training. So I, I mentioned first leadership, but then we provided training all over the state 
um, for elementary, middle, and high, um, now really focused on high because um, we've been focused K-8 up until this point this year, um, but really have provided lots of training and resources. Um, you know, teachers are busy in their classrooms. They don't have time to find the resources, so it really has to be structured, and everything has to be at their fingertips. If, if you give them the time and the resources, they will do it. And so we had to support our teachers in being able to give them what they need to make this happen for kids. Okay, great. Thank you. So our goal here, really, um, if you were able to attend our first webinar when we talked about the universal screening process and how to go from information to implementation, we want to make sure that we continue along this path for you of very explicitly mapping how you go from the universal screening process to what is called a survey level assessment to actual intervention and progress monitoring. So our goal really is to mirror that concept of systematic and explicit so that when you listen to these webinars, you feel confident that you're armed with enough to implement in your own district or school. Now, we are open and interested in getting feedback with regard to what more you need so be sure to either ask questions at the end of our presentation this morning or just feel free to reach out to me in, in my uh, email, which is in both on the front page of the slides as well as the end page of the slides. So we really want this to be valuable and meaningful to you. So we hope to, uh, to engage you to that level so that you feel really ready to go. Now, Ty, you're going to talk about okay. this, uh, this is important, super important concept that's related to the uh, basic building blocks that we discussed earlier. Yeah, what we found is to get everyone on the same page, we really need some good graphics and visuals and concrete situations where um, you know teachers and leaders can come together and understand what it is that we're trying to say. Um, so we kind of did this brick wall and from the beginning have really used this analogy. Um, and if you consider each layer of brick, so right, teachers, um, leaders, they're, they're brick masons. For, um, and each layer, um, what we like to consider are the standards at each grade level, right? So there's standards and there's skills that students need in order to be successful. And so if you think about, if you think to pre-K or kindergarten, wherever you stand on that topic, but and consider that very bottom foundation wrong, you know, your kindergarten year. So you're, you're teaching the students all the skills that they need. But then there's these students that start missing bricks along the way. So it either wasn't taught to them explicitly or systematically. Um, some students, you know, kind of come to us with this level of knowledge. Um, and what some educators like to say is, you know, they're going to learn despite what we do. Um, but there are some students that really need this explicit systematic teaching um, and sometimes reteaching and intervention, right, to fill in um, gaps that they're missing. So each layer, you know, is a set of standards or a set of skills that students should need. If a student should start to miss a brick at, you know, kindergarten, and then the next layer comes at first grade, and we're missing bricks at first grade, and then the next layer comes at second grade, and we're missing bricks there, and on and on and on, eventually the wall caves. Because if, we are, if we're missing all of these bricks, so students that, that doesn't um, get taught explicit phonics, right? They're not able to decode new and unfamiliar words. They're not fluent readers, so they can't comprehend information. If all these bricks are missing, the, often to, students can play school up to a certain point, but you start getting into fifth and sixth, and that, those walls cave. Um, most frequently, we see it around the third grade year start happening, but then fourth, fifth, sixth, it really starts to cave in. And so the concept around multi-tiered systems of support is how do we determine those, those um, bricks that are missing and making sure that we're filling them in or plugging them in so that student's wall doesn't cave. They have a nice solid foundation. They have a nice solid layer at each grade level so that we aren't watching them um, essentially crumble as the work gets harder uh, and the expectations increase. Um, so really in a multi-tiered system of support, you're focused on laying those foundational pieces and filling in all of the bricks so that the students don't have any missing, um, missing bricks. Okay, let's take this to the next level. 
which you we're going to go through two different views of reading that are actually you know quite consistent with each other but one is a uh, graphic example and one is another kind of a uh, graphic example we want to make sure that we drive this point home though uh, how important it is to uh, assess and focus on these uh, basic building blocks so how you go ahead with this slide and then I'll go ahead and do my slide on the next one oh sure okay so in, in our state, and in, in every state, really, um, school systems should be focused on the five areas of reading. They're the five found out foundational areas of reading that are necessary in order for students to um, be able to use information, to comprehend what it is that they're reading. Um, and so, so basically, this kind of graphic really sums it up well, and I love using this one. Um, two domains, basically, you're, you need to teach those decoding, right? And then you need to teach language comprehension. And those two together equal a student who can comprehend what it is that they're reading. But if either areas of those are missing, the student is not going to learn to read and comprehend well. So we kind of like to make this a math problem. So um, you see the times table there in the middle, time, um, the multiplication sign. So if you say do not teach decoding, right but you teach language comprehension so there's zero for decoding multiply that by one for language comprehension because say yes in fact we did teach language comprehension zero times one is still equals zero so if we haven't taught students how to decode but we have taught language comprehension those still students still aren't going to be able to um, read and com comprehend what it is that they're reading if, in fact, we teach decoding, but we don't build language comprehension, we still have zero on the other end. So you really need to teach decoding one times language comprehension one equals one. That's reading comprehension, right? So you can kind of put that any numbers in there you want. I just use the zero one factor. But basically, under decoding, you have to explicitly teach phonological, phonological and phonemic awareness and then phonics, right? And under language comprehension, vocabulary, and text comprehension, and you have to build fluency at both in order to multiply them together to get reading comprehension. So it's very important that teachers understand how to teach reading, um, and that's a real challenge uh, nationally. In our state, I'll speak specifically, it's a very big challenge. Um, um, te not, not, by the, not anything wrong with what the teachers are trying to do. They're trying to do their best, but let's take higher education, for example. If, in fact, higher education is not teaching to a graphic such as this and not teaching teachers how to look at all five areas of reading and how to teach that explicitly in the classroom setting, then students are going to have gaps because the teachers don't know how to teach reading. We shouldn't have teachers coming from ed prep programs that are especially going to teach, you know, in the K-5, K-8 grades that do not know how to teach reading. But, but what we see in our reality is that the majority of our school systems are struggling to retain, retrain teachers that are coming out of ed prep programs. So this is really a deep-rooted issue, and in our state we're working with ed prep programs the same as we are school systems to improve how we teach reading. And I think it's just important to talk about this piece, the balance between reading, how ed prep programs teach teachers to teach reading, and how as a school system we embrace the five areas of reading and make sure there's a good balance in the classroom and that it's in it, that it's all happening. Um, the other part of this is, you know, reading actually begins very early on, right? Those listening and those speaking, um, speaking years. And so we always say when we go into a kindergarten classroom, if we walk in and it's a quiet classroom, we're really worried, right? Um, because we know that teaching reading comprehension begins with the listening, speaking, then explicitly teaching decoding, and the whole language comprehension piece. Complex fit together and there has to be a good balance between all. Um, and so I, I feel like, Michael, yours is going to be um, somewhat similar and kind of braiding those together, but I'll let you walk through those pieces. Yeah, I think we're both saying the same thing and just using different visuals for it. So this is from uh, Scarborough, who is uh, at Yale University. He's a contemporary of uh, Dr. Sally Shaywitz. And he created this really lovely graphic that I, I love to use a lot. Um, it's called the many strands that are woven into skilled reading. And the way I orient people to this graphic is I ask them to start at the lower left where we talk about word recognition. And this is what Ty was talking about in terms of the super basic building blocks. We need to address 
whether a child, if a child has weaknesses in phonological awareness, we need to address that explicitly. And that will help us build our decoding skills, and which then leads to the ability to develop a sight vocabulary. So that is the foundation that we need to build from, because if you don't have a strong foundation, you're going to have some real issues. Now, as the child develops as a skilled reader, they're going to be able to start bringing in more sophisticated language processing skills and more cognitive processing skills that are going to allow them to become what we call uh, increasingly strategic. Now, first, let me talk about, let me go back a little bit. With regard to word recognition, the goal there is to work with the child so that they increase automaticity so that they're not struggling at that basic level. So, you know, I talk about it, if you have a, a, a bucket of energy and you're expending 85% of your energy on these very basic skills, then you're going to have very little when it comes to the higher order language comprehension skills and the ability to think strategically. So at the lowest level, we want to increase automaticity. At the highest level, as a child develops their literacy skills, we want to help them become increasingly more strategic with regard to how they use their background knowledge, building their vocabulary understanding syntax and semantics and morphology, being able to leverage their, their verbal reasoning and their literacy knowledge so that it, they become increasingly more fluent and they become discrete leaders so that their fluent execution and coordination of word recognition, recognition and text comprehension leads them to be a happy and effective reader. So I think, um, I think we... I think we're pretty clear about this is a very important philosophical underpinning for us. And um, so we're going we're gonna to reflect that in what we do for the rest of today. So these are questions that I would like to ask Ty. Um, and the first one is, how would, you, how would understanding your simple view of reading benefit Tier 2, Tier 3, or special ed intervention? I think we'll talk more about this in terms of the survey level assessment and getting down to that root cause of what's happening with the students so that we can intervene effectively. But the simple view of reading is really going to help you understand what are the areas of reading, what am I looking for in a struggling reader, and how can what we have provided at the school level be beneficial for that student, right? So we want to make sure that we're aligning interventions for students in their area of need so in order to be able to align interventions effectively, we have to know what the problem is, right? We have to know what it is we're intervening on, um, which really requires us to have a good understanding of the simple view of reading, of reading in general. So whether you're using Scarborough's rope or you're using the simple view of reading, that understanding of how these pieces work together and knowing at the most basic level, if a student uh, doesn't have phonemic awareness, they're really going to struggle with the phonics piece, right? So we have to be able to drill down to find what the most basic level is so that we know where to begin um, intervention. What about Tier 1, the core instruction? Well, I, yeah, and so sometimes, uh, you know, this, this happens a lot. Um, even as we've been out training, we know there's this gap between what happens in intervention and what happens in core instruction. And so for core instruction, we have put a lot of our um, effort into saying, you know, if teachers are explicitly teaching these skills, we're going to have a lot less students that require Tier 2, or Tier 3 intervention or special ed intervention, right? Because if we are taking those 15 or 20 minutes a day in our kindergarten and our first grade classes to explicitly teach these areas, the likelihood of uh, a large percentage of students needing intervention uh, is, is a lot less. Um, and so that's why we talk about that whole RTI triangle and it being a well-oiled machine, because if we're meeting the needs of 80% of students in Tier 1, then we're only going to have 10 to 15% of students needing Tier 2 intervention or 3 to 5% of students needing Tier 3 interventions. In a well-oiled machine where teachers explicitly teach all these skills, you will still have students that need Tier 2 and Tier 3 in special education intervention. This is not meant to be um, 
eradicating intervention, if you will. But tier one core instruction is necessary. It's necessary to teach them explicitly so we have less students requiring tier two and tier three interventions, right? It's more effective. The the whole programming is more effective if you're targeting tier one instruction. And we also have to make that link between, you know, what interventions occurring at tier two, tier three, or special ed, and what's happening inside of the classroom all day long. Um, my colleagues and I like to say, and my team like to say, um, a student doesn't have a reading deficit just during intervention time. They have a reading deficit all day long all day during core instruction, not just that 30 or 45 minutes that they're getting intervention. So we have to link that to what's happening in the classroom. When we're doing the I do, we do, you do in that tier one, we're breaking out into small groups. How are we differentiating that instruction for that student that's receiving intervention? How are we making sure students are accessing our core instruction? And so we have a lot of districts who are doing a great job in training the teachers that plan for all students that can't access your instruction first, and you will take care of the needs of everyone in your room. So we're doing a lot of um, work around, around Tier 1 instruction and making that link between students' needs, deficit areas, and what they're receiving at intervention and making sure that's connected to core instruction. I think you pretty much answered the third question. Uh, you, yeah, I think so. I was looking at yeah. that as I was going through. Yeah. <laughs> so, so well, that's good. That's good. I mean, it, it harkens back to your earlier point is that right now we need to do a better job supporting our teachers in terms of their own understanding of literacy development and how that happens. And so if you don't have that kind of training at the university level or you don't get that training in your professional development, you're going to be at a loss in the classroom when you uh, see a child start to struggle. So it really is all about yeah, creating a, a, a container for general ed teachers to get the support that they need. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'd add to that third bullet, Michael, is um, is that collaboration piece, I mean, which we kind of talk about as our guiding principle. So if we have an interventionist who's providing intervention at Tier 3, but we're not collaborating with the general education teacher on what's happening, um, then, then there's a lot of connections that are lost, right? If a teacher's mindset is, when that student goes to intervention, they're being taken care of, but she doesn't have a, or he does not have a good understanding of what, what the areas of need are, what intervention's occurring, if the student's making progress or not, um, then, then there's, there's a missing link there. And so we really talk about that collaboration piece, and we really talk about how the general education teachers really are the experts on the students, not just the person who gives them intervention for 30 or 45 minutes out of the day, but they're the expert, and they're responsible for these students. So they should understand the progress of all the children in their class. They should understand their needs. They should know what intervention they're receiving and if it's working. And so that ownership piece is really huge in the collaboration between the two. And so we have a lot of districts that are working. Um, they do PLCs, and um, most of our districts obviously do PLCs. But what they've worked hard to begin doing is making sure interventionists, whether it be general ed interventionists or special ed interventionists, have common planning times and common um, uh, points of contact with the teachers to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Will you explain PLC, please? Uh, what it is? Just what it professional learning communities. Um, some people call them PLCs. Some people call them other, th but professional learning um, communities. Okay. Basically. It's just they all kind of come together, and it's called many different things. So, okay. um, but there's a time and a place, a space where we can come together and talk about these students individually and if they're making progress. Okay. Um, the other important piece of our RTI framework is that you're making database decisions all the time, and so um, through the, through the framework, you know, teams meet one time a month. Um, for data reviews to look at all students per grade level. And so that's a good opportunity to do a touch point and maybe schedule individual conferencing with teachers if, in fact, there needs to be more discussion about a specific two student. Because those kind of team meetings are pretty intense and they're reviewing all students that are receiving interventions. So sometimes an in particular child doesn't have the you know, or the teacher doesn't have the time to talk about a specific student that they even have more concerns about. So kind of doing individual conferencing okay. um, and through practice. Okay. We're at the 30-minute um, mark, so let's, uh, let's, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's move on. And uh, 
I'm, I'm excited about you talking about this because uh, I think this might be the missing link for a lot of people and for was for me anyway in the beginning. So when you say a reading survey level of assessment, um, how are you helping us find the missing bricks? So I, I can talk to this piece broadly and then I can just speak from experience a little bit. There's several ways to look at this and view this. Um, and there are several assessments out there that are available. Um, so a survey level assessment is basically that next step. So you have a universal screener where you screen all students. And if you're using a curriculum-based measure, you're screening all the areas of reading. And you're basically just getting that hot point of like, okay, which students in my school, a lot of people like to call it a temperature check, which students in my school are, um, are struggling, are falling below the 25th percentile, and which areas are they falling below the 25th percentile? So in our state, um, districts are required to screen in reading and math, and so you might have a student that you know, hits the 25th percentile below in math, but not in reading, or reading and not in math. So basically the understanding is we screen all students universally, K-12 actually in our state, um, as of July 1, 2016 for high school. But, but let's just go with K-8 right now, universally screening all students, um, getting that temperature check, getting who falls below the 25th percentile, but then you're stuck with this this problem here that, well, that was just a touch point. That's just the temperature check. That's to weed out all the rest to make sure we're not over-assessing students and we're not um, doing a lot of additional work we don't need to do. So we're, we're saying, here's this pool of students that fall below the 25th percentile. Now we need to, to start digging. We need to find out more information on these students. And that's really what a survey level assessment is about. Teachers used to think that was just, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And we start saying it's the drill down. It's how you drill down to find the most basic area. And they understand that drill down concept of like drilling down to that most basic skill. Now there are two ways that you can do this. Um, there's additional assessments um, that are basically reading inventories. So some of the intervention programs that you might have in your school have reading inventories. There's free inventories that you can actually Google online. Um, PASS is one of them that Louisa Motes um, talks about. Um, and then there's um, then you can use the, your CBMs that you do for universally, universal screening to drill down. And let me tell you how you do that. So let's say you have a third grade student and um, their curriculum-based measure for um, fluency um, or uh, oral reading fluency comes up low. They're below the 25th percentile. You have two different students here. You have one who um, is a fluent reader. They don't make a lot of mistakes. They just read slowly. Um, well, I shouldn't say fluent reader. They're a reader that does not make a lot of mistakes, but they read slowly. Then you have the student who makes a ton of errors, right? And so they are not reading fluently because they have lots of errors. Well, those are two different students. I have a student who can decode new and unfamiliar words, but they read slowly. So the intervention for that student is going to look very different. It really appears that we need the fluency intervention for that student. We can talk a little bit more about that. But this other student that makes a ton of errors, that's a red flag to me and my data team and my team meetings that, ooh, this student may have some decoding issues here. They make a ton of errors. Um, and so that's when I'm going to want to say, well, I need some phonics inventories. I need to really be able to drill down with the student to get to the root of the problem here. Um, but this other student who doesn't have a ton of errors that just has fluency um, concerns, their rate is slow, I'm going to be really working on that student with a reading fluency uh, intervention and probably don't need to dig much deeper on that kid. But this other kid with a ton of errors, I need to drill down and find out what is the most basic deficit for that student um, that, that I need to be working on. And again, there are tons of free inventories. There are some that come with intervention programs. Um, and there's the, um, you know, one that I used to use a lot with the, uh, the CTOP. So there, there's a ton of inventories that you can use for phonological processing, for phonics, for phonological awareness. Um, really, you just want to know what is the assessments that you have available and what they measure. And you want to make sure if you're assessing a student that you understand the measure and what it is you're looking for. Um, so again, temperature check, universal screening, survey level assessment is that drill down finding that next step because it, it's no good to, for those two examples of students that I gave, to provide a decoding intervention, um, a phonics intervention for a student that ha that does not have phonics deficits. Right. Gotcha. That has fluency. Okay. All right. 
Oh, this is a, this is a great resource. And um, this, again, came from uh, Ty. So we wanted to just provide this for everyone. Uh, and I think at this, this level of resolution, I mean, obviously, we're not going to go through this whole thing. But the idea is that here is a takeaway that you can keep with you to help organize your thinking predicated on the domain or area of weakness. So do you want to do you want to orient really quickly to, uh, people to this Ty, or do you want to just point it out yeah, and then I mean, keep moving? Yeah, I, it, to me, um, we have always asked districts to look at all areas of deficit, define them, right? Understand what it is that you're looking for, so that when you're trying to measure it, you have a good understanding of what you're looking for and how you can move forward with an intervention. So, we um, at the state level. We're not allowed to come out and name interventions without a review process, which we eventually ended up doing. But this was kind of that first step of saying, here's domains, areas of need, here's the definition, here's the associated deficits that go along with that domain, like basic reading. Um, here's the characteristics of interventions that you'd want to be looking at, and here's how you measure them. So if you're using a curriculum-based measure, what are the measures that you would use in order to um, tell if the student is making progress for progress monitoring. So that last column is really related to progress monitoring and how it is that we can monitor the progress of students during their intervention. I just think this is so cool. It's really, really And we cool. have that for reading. I'm sorry? I said, and we have that for reading and math. I believe we have the math one at the end with the resources. So Yes, we do. We do. OK. So these are really questions that the school districts and individual schools must ask themselves. So if you're in this process right now and you're listening to us, these are some of the things you really need to ask yourself about so that you can get a sense for what your next steps should be. So you go ahead and go through these, Ty, because this is something that you, this is your area of expertise. So if you have some comments on each yeah. one of these, that's great. Well, I think you framed it well in the beginning, Michael. It's more about the fact that, you know, it's continuous improvement, and we're trying each year to get better as a school system, as a school, as a school system, a district, and as a state. And so there's these questions that we really want to focus on and then steps we want to take in order to get there. So, so basically, we've told districts, audit all of the interventions in your district. Or if I'm speaking to administrators, audit all of the interventions in your school. And by that, I mean... Um, using the tool that was provided above, that reading associated area of deficit, and the intervention characteristics say, okay, here are our deficits, here's all the interventions I have, which ones meet each area of deficit? And then you'll know where your gaps are. You'll know where you have interventions, and then you'll know where your gaps are. So you really, really want to audit and then look at or identify the gaps that you have in interventions that are available for students in your school. So you might have tons of great information on phonics and tons of great interventions on phonics, but when you look at the information, you have nothing for reading fluency or reading comprehension. So, um, so you just want to do a really good audit and then list those interventions so the teachers have the information there so we know if a student has, you know, Finding stuff that's here's what we have available at our school for interventions. Here's the intervention we're going to try for this student because it looks to best meet their needs. Um, and then it helps you plan for future purposes. One, one issue you have, you know, right when you're starting a framework like RTI was, well, we don't have interventions. And we're like, um, go and dig through your closets because, you know, when we go to schools, we see lots of shrink wrap stuff on shelves that look really good um, just from our background knowledge and knowing what works. And districts don't realize what they actually have. So using this chart above, identify those areas and try to move forward and understand where your gaps are so you can plan for future purchases or trainings um, that your teachers need based on your data. Okay. All right. Now that begs the, that begs the question, right? Let's do a let's do a case study. Let's talk a little bit about Garrett here, and then we will go into the uh, deep dish process for assessing what's most appropriate, and then we'll kind of circle back to Garrett and talk about him again. So this okay. is um, your guy. You go ahead and and uh, tee this young man up. Okay. So I'm just going to read it because I'm not sure who had the opportunity to print out the materials first, but Garrett is currently a fourth grade student at Sunnyside Elementary School. 
After the Winter Universal screening, the RTI data team met and determined that Garrett was in need of intervention due to his performance and measures of oral reading fluency, in which he fell below the 10th percentile. So they've done a universal screening, they used curriculum-based measures, the student falls below the 10th percentile on oral reading fluency. In particular, his teacher reported that Garrett struggled in all subject areas. He was unable to work independently and was often off task. I'm sure this sounds like a student that we all know. Yeah. Um, after Mr. Gerard, the reading coach, or you can call him reading interventionist, whatever it might be in your district or state, or he administered a survey level assessment, which we already talked about, so he's doing that drill down. He's trying to find the deficit area. And he found that the foundational deficit was identified within uh, closed syllables uh, di with diagraphs, doubles, and blends, as well as limited high-frequency word recognition. Okay, Ty, let's talk about next steps. We've got three bullets here. I'm going to ask you to go through those, and then I've got a question for you on the third one. So let's first talk about what we need to do next in order to best meet the needs of, of Garrett. Yeah. Well, based on the information we already reviewed, you're going to determine what level of intervention that Garrett needs. You're going to need to decide who can provide the instruction, what intervention he needs, what time of day, when he's going to receive the intervention, uh, and how frequently. Of course, in the state of Tennessee, when a student is receiving intervention at Tier 2 or Tier 3, they're receiving it five days a week, or that's what we recommend as most effective practices. Um, and again, we want to decide who is responsible. Is it the classroom teacher during an intervention time, or is it the interventionist um, that the school employs to provide intervention to students? And does it matter if it's Tier 2 or Tier 3 for that student? So there's a lot of decision-making that needs to occur within those uh, data teams or within those decision-making teams that we've already kind of discussed um, prior um, to this webinar and our past webinars. Okay. Now... This third bullet, I just want to interject before you mention, uh, before you speak to it. We all, we're talking about t uh, types of intervention approaches, but there's another variable that we really need to be thoughtful about, and that is intensity. So how about if we move to the next slide, and, and we'll ask you to talk about best practices with regard to intensity. Absolutely. This here was a graphic that we designed to help educators understand um, wh what we mean when we talk about intensity. Um, so uh, in the bottom part, you'll see that um, Tier 2 intervention is in addition to core instruction, and it's 30 minutes daily in the student's area of need. Where Tier 3 becomes more intensive, um, it's smaller groups, and it's 45 to 60 minutes daily, um, and starts to become more programmatic in nature. Um, and then uh, at our top um, intensity are those students who Tier 2 and Tier 3 didn't work for or that demonstrated that intensity need right from the beginning, and that is special education intervention. And in our state, we've worked really hard to redefine what special ed intervention is and what it is not and, and how we want people to view special education, and that is as the most intensive intervention in the continuum of services. So really it's about finding out what level of intensity a student needs in, in order to be successful. Okay. Now, we have, um, I want to I wanna use this moment to talk about two of the resources that we have that um, talk about, and you can, you can expand on this if I get it inaccurate, but to talk about the, the screening instrument review and the rubric that Tennessee uses to decide what the most uh, effective or what the what the best tools would be predicated on what your needs are in the state and so the next several minutes are going to be really core with regard to an explaining the components to the rubric that will drive your decision making and you're going to see slides here but in the resources you're going to have these two really beautifully made they're a little bit, they're beyond checklists, but they're, they help really help you organize your thinking and go through the decision-making process in a really clear step-by-step -step process. So to introduce that, I'm going to ask Ty to walk through each section of the rubric and uh, explain what its meaning is and what the, the, the best practices are. So we'll start 
with uh, some kind of general caveats. So, Ty, tell us a little bit about what your experience has been in Tennessee with regard to getting ready to begin this process. Yeah, it, it seems overwhelming at first, um, and it really is a step-by-step -step process. And, and the, the webinar we created or the information we created prior to this was to help with that first level step, you know, how do you create a team? What do you do with scheduling? Um, how do you know what uh, intervention students need? Or how do you even know what the deficit areas are? So it's a very um, kind of overwhelming uh, view or framework or process, if you will, from in the beginning. Um, and what we've always recommended is that we do this in stages and that it would take three to five years to get a real well-oiled machine. And why I say that is, is if you kind of bite it all up, all up all off at the same time, um, you kind of get bogged down. And so we, we really have walked through with educators, you know, don't get bogged down in definitions and overcomplicated language. Um, try to define things in the simplest terms. Um, when we're talking about reading, when we're talking about math, when we're talking about writing, how can we define it so that everyone understands? Um, and so we, we try to make sure that we define everything well, what we call operational definitions. Um, Evidence uh, has been around for years, and we'll start throwing out terms such as evidence-based uh, or evidence-based interventions or research-based interventions. And this this stuff has been around for years and years and years. It is nothing new, but it's how you use the evidence. It's how you use the research to make good informed decisions. Um, and a lot of times, you can go ahead and put that. Um, that work on a vendor or a program that's trying to get you to purchase their products or just having rubrics using tools that have already been developed, which such that I'm going to go over with you today, to kind of help with those, those language barriers and that complication piece. But just knowing that this, is all, this has all been around for years, um, and we're just putting it in a structured way to help everyone understand. Um, Vendors and programs are very familiar with this kind of language, and if they're not, they should be. Um, and there's a clear distinction between vendors or programs that do not understand evidence and peer review and research and validity measures. Um, but, but what I said a few minutes or a minute ago was, when you are asking um, an intervention or a vendor or a um, person who's trying to sell you a program, when you are asking them for evidence, they should readily hand that over to you. And most frequently, if it's a good product, they hand it to you willingly before you even ask. Um, so that's something that you put on them. That's the burden that a vendor or a program um, has to prove that they have the evidence um, that they work. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of walk through those pieces just a little bit to, to say that um, this isn't something that you as an administrator or a teacher or any other professional need to go out and try to do all this research yourself. There's tools that already are available and um, the vendor should be submitting this information to you, not you digging for it. So we want you to be informed, we want you to know what you're looking for, and we want you to know what to ask for, but not necessarily have to do all this work yourself. Okay, great. I'm going to go to the next slide. This is where we really dig into each of the five sections I believe you've got for for the rubric. And again, I I recommend that people print out the uh, two forms that we have in the resources that kind of frame this concept so that you can follow along that way because this is really kind of the core piece of this whole thing. And I want to make sure that this is as useful and meaningful as possible for you. So. Ty, let's uh, launch on section one, and you just tell me when I need to advance the slides. Sure. So basically, I think the, the best thing to how to understand this, and if you have it printed out in front of you, then you'll be able to um, kind of walk through uh, with me. But if not, I'm just going to try to visually describe it as much as possible. So we have a several page rubric um, that's broken into sections, and each section takes an area that would be important to a person wanting to purchase an intervention program. So let's say in my school that I have you know, several students with reading deficits, I have some uh, major concerns in phonics in my school, some in phonemic awareness, some in um, fluency, some in comprehension. I'm going to need to know what areas are my concerns, what areas my students need interventions, and then I'm going to need uh, a series of steps to walk through with vendors or programs in order to determine 
if in fact they're trying to sell me a good product. So we're going to kind of walk through that. So visually this looks like sections broken up in specific areas that people would need to know um, about a program or a vendor before they actually spent money to and, and purchased these products. Um, so that's the intent of this, to, to help inform districts and schools before they make purchases um, and get them familiar with vocabulary that's necessary to get evidence-based programming in their schools. So section one, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just wondering what ELA 1A is. ELA 1A would be evidence of a, a standard. So for an R state, an ELA 1A standard is our Tennessee standard, our ling English language art standard. What we're trying to impress upon is that we are not looking for standards-based interventions. We don't want an intervention that claims to meet the need of students that are missing just that one strand of a standard, right? We're looking for interventions that help us intervene in specific skills deficits. So we're making an example because some vendors will say, oh no, we're, we are focused on RTI, and yes, we're focused on skills-based. If a student has a reading fluency deficit, see, here's our product. We focus on ELA standards. Well, that's exactly opposite of what we want to see from a vendor. So if someone's coming to you and saying, we um, remediate standards, well, that's not what we're looking for here. Um, and so we, we have to be very clear and provide an example of that. Don't vendor come to us with a standards-based um, remediation approach. That's a tier one issue. I'm sure you have great products. Thank you very much. But that's a tier one uh, core instruction issue. Right now we're talking about what's needed at tier two and tier three in special education. And so okay. that first, the first part of the, um, the rubric really breaks down reading deficits, math, and writing. So if you're having a vendor submit in the area of reading, then you're going to focus on 1A, page 2. If you're having a vendor that's um, submitting for math, then you're going to focus on 1B, page 4, and, it, uh, and so on with writing 1C, page 5. And that's the first section. So you're just going to be filling that out based on the area that the vendor claims that you're submitting for. Okay, you ready? Yep. So I guess this kind of takes back to what Michael was just asking, the difference between those um, standards and skills. We have this all broken down into skills area deficits. So in the area of basic reading, we're looking for interventions that are going to focus on phonological awareness, phonics, letters, letter sounds, reading fluency, reading comprehension, written expression, math calculation, um, or math reasoning or problem solving. So those are the six areas of deficits that are defined in our state and what we are asking for um, intervention programs to submit for uh, to be reviewed. Um, if it doesn't fall in one of these areas, then, then we're not looking at that as an intervention because now you're talking about a standards approach. Math, you know, for uh, 4A would be a standard in math for fourth grade. Well, we don't want a standards approach. We want interventions that are focused on these areas that are on your page now in the deficit areas. And so that's what we ask them to submit for. If it wasn't one of those areas um, in 1A, B, or C, then we did not, um, we threw that, uh, what claimed to be an intervention, what would have been a remediation technique or tool um, out. It, it didn't get reviewed. Okay, I can move on. And so this kind of just brings in that fact just a little bit more around skills versus standards, but it helps define it a little bit more. In our state, in many other states, because I work in a lot of um, national networking uh, and, and talking through these pieces and how we define things, a lot of the failure um, in some areas around RTI is that Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions have not been defined well. Um, and in our state, we found it necessary to define it well. If we have an expectation, we need to define it well so that everyone knows how to meet that expectation. And in some states, in some areas, it hasn't been defined, and so they're just reteaching standards um, instead of actually providing an intervention. While reteaching of standards is necessary for some students that are just struggling on a strand, if you will, of a standard, um, and don't have a skills deficit, that's fine. Again, not for this, not for this, um, this process. And, and instead, we're looking for those areas that are skill specific, that students are falling below at the 25th percentile or below, and they need intervention in that specific skill area. So um, in order for it to be defined as skills-based, you're intervening on a skills deficit area. 
um, and, and it's not adaptive, so we, we want to make sure that we're able to measure the same thing and students are receiving intervention on the same area until they've, until they've mastered that area, essentially. So we want something that's consistently measuring the same skill and not jumping all over the place from standard to standard. Um, and so the standards base, you know, they're looking to intervene on a standard and what we define tier one standards based is reteaching remediation. So you are reteaching what's already happening in core instruction, not focused focus on skills deficit. It most often is adaptive, so they're focused on if he met this strand of the standard under ELA, then now we have to move to the next strand of that standard um, and make sure he's mastered that. Again, not what we're looking for in this instance. So that just really is that side-by-side -side view to try to help in our state everyone understand when we're talking about Tier 2 and Tier 3, we're talking about skills-based intervention. When we're talking about Tier 1 and kids who just need help in Tier 1 because they don't have a skills deficit, then that is a standards-based remediation. Um, this is all about definition and what we're defining and what we're looking for. Okay. And, you ready? Yep. All right, so here we're going to talk about evidence-based and peer-reviewed. Um, evidence-based and peer-reviewed viewed is um, kind of the way that uh, researchers look at information. They want to make sure that there's evidence to support the intervention. We want to make sure that it's reviewed by their peers so that it's not just one study that can find um, one vendor that is doing studies on themselves and say, yes, in fact, oh, my product works. We want to make sure that vendors are having outside researchers um, look at their product and make sure that there's evidence that it, in fact it works. So we, we use this to examine all kinds of different work, um, not just in the educational field, this goes beyond the educational field, but today we're talking about it in that way. And we want to make sure that um, through all of the research that whatever is purchased, whatever product is purchased and we want to intervene with students using that, we want to make sure that it's going to impact the majority of the students that have that skills deficit. Um, so we really just wanted to prep schools around how we look at evidence base and how we look at peer reviewed so that we're able to walk through a series of steps to make sure when we're spending all of this money that in fact there's evidence that this will work. So some of the metrics or um, measures around that, when we're looking at the product, we want to see a result of 0.25 or greater. Um, that means the program is effective, and the um, higher the results, the better the, the program is or the more effective it is for that specific deficit area, for that specific intervention, um, and for that result in that population. So we really are looking for a higher number there. At minimum, 0.25 is, is what we're looking for. Fidelity, this can be measured in many ways. For our rubric, if you were looking at it right now, you would be looking at the fact that we asked them to say inner rater reliability and meaning that you had two observer, at least two observers go into a setting, observe the intervention occurring, making sure that intervention is working um, given the fidelity, the fidelity um, checks that, that are provided to them, and then seeing if there is agreement among those two people that the intervention was implemented with fidelity or is being implemented with fidelity um, to get results. We wanted the programs to demonstrate the fact that they use random assignments so that students were not hand-selected, um, and we wanted to make sure that students were at risk. We didn't want students that are average and don't have deficit areas to receive the intervention and then show growth in that area. We really wanted students, them to demonstrate they um, had students in their studies with their interventions that were at risk. Um, and then we wanted positive findings of, in multiple, uh, multiple studies, not just one. Um, and that posed a problem for many interventions. Um, some have one, some have two. Um, but, but to do large-scale studies inside schools sometimes is rather difficult, and so some of them lack um, the positive findings of multiple studies. They may have one, sometimes two, but multiple is kind of hard for, them, uh, for us to find. Now we want to random sample populations from multiple schools, again, um, given demographics, areas, states, regions. We really wanted um, multiple schools involved in these studies and not just 
one specific area, um, you know, urban versus rural, um, to, to kind of see if we're recommending this in our state using our criteria, will it work in multiple populations um, of students? And then we wanted them to have an end size of 75 or greater, meaning that we wanted at least 75 students in the study. Otherwise, it's a little bit small and it's hard to say that it's effective uh, large scale. Um, so we, so in, in our rubric that we created, um, the, they had to meet four out of the six in the area of fidelity. Um, and then it's necessary to have D, meaning that they had multiple studies. Um, and so that happened to be an area um, that we struggled to find a lot of our um, intervention programs to have is D. But in our criteria, four out of the six had to be met and they had to have D. Okay. I can move to the next slide. So section three of our rubric was around systematic and explicit instruction. Um, and mainly this piece was there so that, it, so that it's helping instruct teachers what to do next. They're busy with students all day long. Not necessarily do we always have to have a significantly scripted program because some teachers um, do not need that, and then others do, but we really wanted one that had a carefully thought out plan that showed the teachers the sequence of where you move next and what the objectives are and have ongoing assessment for the teacher to keep um, kind of going through that cycle of here's what I do with the student, here's how I teach the skill, here's how I scaffold this instruction for the student, so I need to be supporting them um, in, until they can master that on their own or move the scaffolds away. And then um, really just have a very good view of how that teacher moves from beginning to end of lesson and prepare next lesson. We really wanted it to be a systematic approach for that teacher. Um, so that it so that it's easier to use. We wanted explicit instruction. So a lot of our programs that submit are very computer based. Um, and what we don't want is our students to be sitting in front of a computer all day long without uh, intervention or face to face contact with the teachers. Um, we know through evidence that that face-to-face -face contacts is, is necessary, um, but we also know that technology can be used as a support. It just can't be the only means of instruction. So explicit instruction was very important to us um, when creating this uh, rubric, if you will, um, and it just involves that direct face-to-face -face teaching um, so that we made sure that when they were submitting that if they had a program um, computer-based only with no teacher face-to-face -face, that, that they weren't going to be making it in that specific area. Okay, good. That's very, very important because what we do know, especially with regard to teaching, reading, that lots and lots of teachers out there really need the support in terms of their own professional development so they understand, you know, they've got a model they can use for systematic instruction and a model they can use for explicit instruction. And we find that there's a lot of teachers that really need help with that out there. So in the area of systematic, they had to make two out of three of the criterion. In the area of explicit, they had to meet two out of the three criterion in order to be um, to meet that area of the rubric and, and say met. Because okay. the each of these specific areas, we're looking at did they meet or did they not meet? So that when someone's going to purchase this as a tool, then they know what they're getting, right? That was the whole idea of this review process. When our LEAs in the state of Tennessee go to purchase this, they know, you know what? They met on systematic, but they don't meet on explicit. Or they, they met the validity measure, right? But it was never peer reviewed. And how important are each of those factors to us before we spend all of this money to purchase this product? So we said in order to meet in these areas, we set that criteria. It just happened to be in systematic that it's two of the three and explicit it's two of the three. Okay. The intervention in tier and grade, you know, this kind of goes back to that um, chart where we showed you on the continuum, what level of support does a student need? Do they need tier two intervention? Do they need tier three intervention? Do they need special education intervention? So when we were asking programs to uh, submit to us, we wanted them to self-identify. Do you identify um, your intervention as just a lower level tier two intervention, so, um, or more intensive tier three, or most intensive special ed intervention? Um, and each, each tier, um, the criteria uh, was, 
tougher as you move up, so on the continuum. So tier two was less tough to meet the criteria than tier three, and tier three, uh, special ed was tougher to meet the criteria than um, tier three. So it kind of moved up with intensity, kind of just like the tiers do for students in intensity. So was it for the vendors when they had to submit um, and look at their look at our criteria and provide evidence. Um, they had to self-select whether they were tier two, tier three, or special ed intervention. Okay. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, one thing I didn't say on that, Michael, was the grade. And then they also had to identify what grade that their intervention showed evidence for. We know that in ninth grade, some intervention programs are going to look different than they do in second or third grade. And so we wanted them to self-identify also what age group level that they have evidence of impact with. Okay. So, Move that um, slide a little quickly, but we're okay. Okay, so metrics for interventions are tiers. How they met that criteria, how they had to self-identify, and how we went back to look at that is kind of um, what's on your screen now. So if there was evidence that they um, had a program that met the criteria of 25 to 30 minutes in duration, um, and that could be delivered daily, right? So we needed enough um, material information that could be delivered daily for 25 to 30 minutes, because in our state, that's how tier two is is defined, 25 to 30 minutes delivered daily. So in order for them to say they were a tier three, it had to be 45 minutes worth of material or intervention um, and had to be and could be delivered daily because in our state, tier three is defined as 45 to 60 minutes. So at minimum, it had to be 45 minutes. And then special ed intervention was 45 to 60 minutes. Um, it was more individualized and could be delivered daily. Um, so each of these, Tier 2, it had to be proved that it could be uh, in a group setting. Tier 3 had to prove it would be in a smaller group setting. And special ed, one, you know, even smaller yet still, and more individualized and have wraparound supports involved in it, in the instructional focus. So, um, and, and so the other area of concern was around um, assessment support. And so what we don't want is our teachers having to use um, made up measures to measure a skill that a program um, intends to um, work on with the student. So, for example, if I have a program that says I'm a, I'm a phonics program and here's all of the areas that um, I can support you to reach for students, yet yeah, I don't provide an assessment measure for you, there's no way for that teacher to keep checking back to see whether that student has mastery of the areas in which they're teaching them. And we don't want that to have to be made up because we want it to align. Alignment is huge. Um, so we ask them for evidence um, of assessment support for teachers. And the SLA stands for? That's the survey level assessment. So we survey talk level about. assessment, right. Gotcha. We want them to be able to, so if it's a tier two group, we want them to be able to dig down. If it's phonics, we want them to be able to drill down to find out exactly what areas that the student is struggling with. Um, a, a large problem, Michael, uh, in our state and many other states is that um, we get a program and we, we believe that fidelity means that you, you um, start it from beginning and go to end. Where many students need that, there are some students that just miss certain skills along the way, and so there's different entry points that, that you can get into and different exit points. Like, we don't want to waste students' time, right? Their, their time is critical. So if they have a skill, we want to just keep moving. So there needs to be those different entry and exit points, and that's kind of where a survey level assessment comes in. Here's the program, here's how you drill down to find the need, and here's where the student needs to enter into the program in order to fill in those gaps and then exit the program where they need to exit. Okay. Um, it's very individualized, and we really want survey level assessments for, um, for that piece for teachers. Okay. Two more for this one. Yeah. Um, this is really important. I think some people kind of forget about this piece when it comes to um, intensity. And that's really um, how frequently is the student uh, able to respond. We know the more engaged the student is, the more time for response, that reciprocal back and forth, the, the more intense the intervention is for the student because they're getting more from it. So we ask the vendors to submit um, you know, evidence that at Tier 2 that there were opportunities for the student to respond, but at Tier 3 we wanted, we wanted increased response for, um, for a smaller group of students. And then special ed intervention, um, 
we wanted them to be able to be responding more frequently than tier two and tier three. So again, more individualized. The smaller the group, the more evidence that that student's going to respond to that intervention. And so in special ed uh, education intervention, it's critical that those students have a significant amount of response time because they need that more one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence. OK. Ready? Yep. OK. Um, so basically, the metrics for this were that at Tier 2, and this is kind of gets into where I said that it gets more intensive um, the higher the tier. So at Tier 2, uh, the intervention must have met three of the five criteria that we listed. Tier 3, four out of the five. And special education intervention, they must have met four out of the five. They didn't have to be perfect. However, it was required that it met com uh, component E. And if you switch back to um, component E, on there, the special education intervention. So it has to be individualized um, to meet students' need, and there must be individualized entry point and exit points. Where we kind of want that for tier three, it's a requirement to have it at special ed intervention. Um, so. Okay. Okay, and then the grades. So again, just going back to what we um, talked about a little bit already is that, you know, what grade level do they claim that this intervention is effective with? Yes, we can teach phonics in, in ninth and 10th grade, but it can't mimic the programming uh, that that's occurring at first and second grade because students will look at it as an insult. They will not want to do it. They will not be a part of it. In our, and um, that's just our reality where students are getting to high school at some points with, you know, lack of phonics. Um, skills or fluency, and they're going to need intervention. So we want to make sure that we have interventions that are effective for high school students, middle school students, and elementary students. Um, same thing. We don't want an elementary student, you know, reading, you know, scenarios at the high school level. You know, it's the same. It's the same kind of difference. You got to make sure that it's an accurate intervention that it's appropriate for their age and grade level. And then teacher usability, um, it, it kind of goes back to that, um, you know, systematic, explicit type things. Um, but we want to make sure that there's planning, there's pacing, uh, there's lessons available, assessments, activities. There's things that they can use to record what it is that they're doing. So basically, you just want clear and easy to read um, material uh, for the teachers and the students. And so, um, so, so basically, if the teacher can understand what it is that they're providing for an intervention, it's going to be more effective for the student. Um, and so we really thought teacher usability was, is really important. And our goal here is all teachers are using these products. So if vendors are submitting an overly complicated product that nobody can use, we can't expect our teachers to be using, and therefore the students are not going to respond. Um, so we want to make sure that teacher usability is high. So, and these are just the metrics for it. So uh, there's materials. I mean, basically it's materials, materials, materials. They're clear and easy to, you know, like the, the teacher's planning and record keeping and instructional support. And so in order for uh, the program to be considered to have high teacher usability, they had to meet two of the three criteria. Okay. Okay. So um, we reviewed several of the interventions that I um, described, um, you know, using that rubric. And so we'll kind of just talk through three. Spire and corrective rating were two that were reviewed. And again, these were reviewed by our public school system um, and uh, people that were volunteered um, or voluntold, I like to say, or they volunteered themselves to use this rubric with the vendors that submitted. Um, we, we went through Spire and we went through corrective reading among many others, um, which is a resource that Michael will be posting um, in the resource page after this webinar. Um, and then Orton Gillingham, since we have done this review, um, we have received lots of information on um, actually lots of um, districts in our state are opting to use this as an intervention program. So we're going to talk to that piece just a little bit that did not go through this review process, however, met the criteria from the rubric. Okay, so basically the SPIRE program, I'm just going to walk through each, each piece. 
Well, I'll actually go through corrective reading first. I'm sorry. So corrective reading, the vendor publisher is McGraw-Hill, and they claim that the area of deficits that they address are basic reading skills, so uh, phonics, uh, phonology awareness, fluency, and reading comprehension. And so when we broke down this rubric, we looked at the area of deficit or focus on reading skill deficit. They submitted for that, and so yes, they met the criteria. They met the area of deficit that they listed. They provide the evidence and, um, and showed that, in fact, these are the areas that they are addressing, these are the areas that they submitted, and these are the areas that we have to review. So in Section 1, corrective reading met our criteria. In, select, in Section 2, for the validity, evidence-based, and peer review, um, this, they met the area for validity where they had results of 25 um, or greater um, that we desired, but they did not meet in the area where less than, uh, they had less than 75% of their um, observers, um, less than 75% of the observations between the observers met fidelity of implementation. So they lacked in that area. Um, and then they did meet the C criteria for the fact that all the students that were in the study fell below the 30th or 25th percentile national norms. And they did not meet the area where um, more than one study was submitted. So they did submit a peer review, but it was only one study instead of two. Um, but their, their populations were randomly selected. And so why it's important, and, they, and their end size or the amount of students in their study were above 75. And it's important to really walk through those pieces really quickly to say their overall validity was not met for corrective reading. But I told you the areas in which they didn't meet and the areas in which they do. And this is kind of where it comes in um, in that there's no one-size-fits-all program and there's no perfect program. Corrective reading does yield results for students. It's an effective intervention overall, and we'll talk about that. But they were missing some key components of what we found necessary at the state level and criteria to say to meet validity. Ours could be a little extreme and maybe not as, um, and, and maybe districts or um, people using this tool would want to reconsider that and maybe think about it a little bit because a lot of our intervention programs that were submitted missed in a couple of those areas. So um, the overall validity had to meet four of the six areas, so they did not meet overall validity. Um, but they did meet uh, in all areas for peer-reviewed um, pieces, it's just they only submitted one study. The systematic and explicit instruction uh, so it, it, there was evidence that um, it was sequenced, that um, it was explicit, and so for overall systematic instruction, um, they met two of the three criteria. For explicit instruction, they met all the criteria in all three areas, and for intervention, um, tier or grade, they had submitted everything for that, and in fact, um, yielded results that they were effective at tier two, tier three, and special education intervention. So they met in all three tiers, if you will, tier two, tier three, and special ed intervention. Um, and then their grade span was three to 12, and they um, presented evidence that, in fact, that was accurate. So overall, the students met, or I mean, I'm sorry, the vendor met in those areas. And then teacher usability, um, corrective reading is a very scripted program, um, and so it has all of the lessons, the planning, the vocabulary, everything built in. So it met in all three of those areas as well for teacher usability um, and, and overall had evidence of being an effective program for those grades 3 through 12. So they met the majority of our criteria and I kind of explained why they didn't meet in that validity area. Now SPIRE, <clears throat> I'm going to go to the next program. SPIRE um, provided evidence that they uh, were effective in basic reading, reading comprehension and fluency, and they met in that area in Section 1. Section 2, validity not met, and here we go again, that they provide evidence, that, uh, evidence but the um, peer review piece was not met. And so there were a couple areas that um, they uh, failed to do as a part of their um, peer review um, and validity measures, and so they did not meet in that area. So you have two pretty well-known intervention programs that did not meet in that specific area. 
Um, they did meet for systematic instruction and explicit instruction. Um, and then for the interventions, they met at Tier 2, Tier 3, and Special Education, and then, and then Teacher Usability they met um, for in grades pre-K pre through 8. Here's the thing about this program um, that I wanted to talk about. Like, so they didn't meet around validity pieces, again, kind of like the corrective reading. In the state of Tennessee, a lot of districts have um, committed to SPIRE. Um, it's a multi-sensory approach um, to teaching reading, and so a lot of our districts are trying to, to go towards that multi-sensory approach. And, um, and so although it didn't meet in the validity area, we're looking at our evidence in Tennessee specific and what this is kind of important to look at. And what we have found is districts that are using this fire program are yielding pretty significant results. So therefore, our belief is that it's a pretty uh, evidence-based program, just even in Tennessee specific. So um, had that criteria maybe not been so tough, they probably would have met in that area as well. Now I'll kind of move to Orton Gillingham, um, and again, I'm just going to preface this by saying that Orton Gillingham did not go through the peer review process. However, given the rubric that we have, given all the evidence that's been submitted to us after that, and given the fact that we're talking about students that have characteristics of dyslexia that are at risk, um, and in the evidence that we know that multisensory approaches to teaching, reading, math um, are very effective for these students. Um, I just quickly went through the Orton-Gillingham and their information and came out where they had met criteria in, in all areas. Um, the, the one uh, concern I have around Orton-Gillingham sometimes is that it, it requires a lot of training for teachers to become very effective at teaching um, using multi-sensory approaches. So districts have to invest in training teachers. It's not a, a program that can just come to you. So for good and uh, very good training, been through the training, um, very uh, effective for students that are struggling. Um, but districts have to be dedicated to making sure their teachers are trained in this and so that they know how to deliver this instruction. You can't just purchase materials and say, you know, provide a multi-sensory approach to reading and go ahead and teach reading that way. They need training. Um, so districts need to commit to that. And we do have many districts in the state of Tennessee that are committing to Orton-Gillingham training, giving all the evidence of the effectiveness, um, especially for um, students that have characteristics of dyslexia. So I really wanted to talk to that, although it had not been through the review process, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions around that. Okay. So is there something on the slide, Ty, that you think um, we should speak to, or is it sort of straightforward? Use the rubric, discuss the data, conduct an inventory on your current inventions. You've talked about that. What deficit areas do interventions address? You've talked about that. Levels of intensity, um, yeah, program address, special ed, how does it differ from Tier 3? Yeah, so I think um, the goal here is kind of going that I do, you know, we do, you do model is for um, those on the phone that will participate in this webinar um, to go back to their populations, their districts, their schools, and kind of begin this step-by-step -step process of looking at what it is they have in their buildings. Um, and then when we come back to our next webinar, kind of be able to um, talk through those pieces. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me just, let's keep moving here. I'm kind of going back and forth. I'm checking with Christy right now with regard, our producer with regard to some uh, Q&A. So the next steps, we're at 1126 uh, CT. So I think if we can invite our listeners to send the questions that they may have that they'd like to have access to Ty right now, let's please go ahead and do that. And Chrissy will be able to capture them, and she's going to send them to us, and we can start uh, working our way through those. And um, then we're going to finish up with walking through the resources that we've provided you because Ty's put together a whole bunch of really really useful stuff that kind of like bolts down a lot of what we've been saying, so to speak. So um, I know this has been an awful lot. I mean, we really jammed through a lot in 90 minutes, so maybe we ought to 
we'll just take a breather right here and um, wait to have a couple of questions come in. And I believe uh, Christy is working on that right now. So, um, Ty, if you, can you think of anything that you wanted to say earlier that you kind of want to want to emphasize or kind of review or anything that you might feel like super critical for people to get through? Questions are on the way, by the way. Okay. I think more than anything, you kind of just hit the nail on the head, right? This, it's a lot of information. And everything I'm spelling out and talking about is a process of over three to five years. So you really have to start at those basic areas and, and auditing and looking at what you have and finding your gaps and hopefully the tools and resources that we're providing through this can help you in that process. I know again in the, the, our previous webinar we really provided a ton of resources around um, you know universal screeners and, and rubrics and information and now this is the intervention, intervention phase so we're trying to walk in steps kind of like yeah. here's what you're going to do first universal screening here's what how you here's how you survey level assess here's how you provide the intervention so if if who you know whoever's on the call and whoever is hopefully benefiting from these can begin with that first process and move through this it's not as as overwhelming as it may seem yeah i think that's a super good point we should have maybe we'll have to remember that in the future we'll have to talk about how this is a lengthy process and then you're going to, they're going to get a major download today but they can relax and understand that they're going to have time to kind of course through all these. So we've got a couple of questions, Ty. The first one is um, from Susan. What distinguishes Tier 3 from Special Ed? Right, like intensity, right? Yeah. Um, so this is a tough question sometimes, and um, which is why Tier 2 and Tier 3 have to be defined well. Um, what often happens is in the special ed world, we try to um, provide everything. And a lot of times we have a lot of students that don't necessarily require special ed intervention that needed those less intensive interventions, right? Because um, special ed is kind of that wraparound of all, all um all services. The one thing that we worried in the state of Tennessee on is that as we were building RTI Tier 2 and Tier 3, that Tier 3 would end up more intensive than special ed education intervention, right? And um, that would be a really uh, kind of a flipped model. So as we worked through an RTI framework, we also developed a special ed framework that says, you know, special ed must be more intensive and here are the ways to make it more intensive. It's really a questioning format. Huh. But realistically, it's, um, it, you know, you don't just depend on the amount of time, right? Because intervention at two or three could be 45 to 60 minutes. You can't just provide special ed intervention for 120 minutes and think that that's going to take care of intensity. So special ed intervention needs to be very specific. It's most often programmatic in nature where we don't require that tier, tier two or tier three is programmatic in nature. You must have the materials to support the intervention. But realistically speaking, special ed is very um, programmatic in nature. In terms of intervention, it's uh, smaller smaller group size or individualized, right? So it must must be smaller in size and individualized. We kind of talked through on the rubric um, a few pieces around there must be more opportunities for frequent interaction between the teachers and the teacher and student. Um, there must be more opportunity to practice the skills that they have. The other thing with special education, uh, again going back to the um, wraparound supports, is a lot of times students who did not respond to Tier 2 or Tier 3 um, or needed special ed intervention support from the get-go um, require accommodations. They require differentiation of Tier 1 instruction um, and, and the intensity of the intervention, um, which is more typically programmatic in nature and at least 45 to 60 minutes um, in, in, in the day of some types of services and support. So, so students that have an IEP have a lot more support wrapped around them where students in Tier 2 or Tier 3 um, have often intensive interventions that are effective, but that's a part of that database decision-making process in determining is this intensive enough for the student. Okay. Um, it's really an IEP, not IEP. An IEP, yes. Okay. Would you say? Uh, or not IEP basically, if you distinguish between the two. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one's more wraparound and intensive and, than than the other. But, but, but the thing I want to come away with here is that um, we don't want to provide more supports than a student needs. Right. Our goal is for them to be independent um, and be able to advocate for themselves and get what it is that they need. So this problem that we've had that's been reoccurring and we're not yielding results in special ed because of this is that all students, you know, we used, we at one point were always pushing all students that struggled to have an IEP and we over accommodated and over supported them and then essentially did not help them to become more independent and often didn't yield results. So we wanted to clearly define special ed as most intensive intervention and here's how that's defined. But we want to make sure that students actually need that level of support because okay. now we have tier two intervention. Okay. Now here's a question from my good friend Kelly Salmon Hurley. And she asks, when you suggest teachers introduce morphological structures, Well, again, and I, my belief is at tier one, right? Um, that teachers have to be trained explicitly in how to do this. Hmm. Um, they have to be they have to be trained explicitly how to teach, um, and so that's not just an that's not just an intervention, a tier two or tier three or special ed. That's in core instruction. That's just good teaching, I think. Wouldn't you say? That's good. Exactly. I think what it reflects is that the teachers have been supported in their efforts to understand the stepping stones of literacy development, correct? Right, exactly. Because Kelly follows up with that with, um, you know, when do you screen for orthographic issues? You know, we're more and more we're talking, we're making it explicit in our discussions about the importance of understanding orthography. And she asked if you have uh, any, if the early screeners are only looking for phonological, or are they also looking for orthographic? And um, do you have a similar chart for the spelling deficits, like you have for reading and math? Yeah, right. So, like, what do we screen for, and what are teaching practices? We know that teaching practices we're going to be using both, right? For that whole phonological loop, that's how we're that's how we're teaching. We're not just teaching um, reading; we're also writing, and we're moving back and forth between the two. The issue that the issue that we've struggled with um, was how fast to run, right? So we have reading and math um, and writing and um, you know, how fast can we move when, when we're taking a whole state, and this is just our state in particular, how can we move um, in stepping stones ourselves? So I would say that we haven't provided as much support in that area in terms of screening, because what we said is if we pick up on the students' deficits in reading, then we're able to drill down to find out where everything is. A lot of our practice, um, when we introduce SOPRIS reading courses, for example, it trains on how to teach the orthographic piece, right? It trains on how to teach those pieces and combine them. Um, but, but in terms of screening for that spelling and writing piece right now, as a state, we have not um, put a universal screening in place for that specific, uh, for, for spelling, uh, essentially, for, for writing. We would screen in writing, right, which would include spelling, it would include, you know, sentences and how many letters they can get on a page. Um, but there are screenings available. It's just a very, na nationally, by the way, it's a lot less um, research and a lot less tools in that specific area when it comes to universal screening and progress monitoring. So I think as um, a, a state and I think nationally as we grow in this area and we're able to implement effectively, we can put procedures in place that address both. There is written expression um, screeners um, we just have not required our districts to do that yet. Mm -hmm. um, instead, what we've asked is if they, their temperature check shows they're at risk in reading, most often students that are struggling with spelling or writing flag on both. Um, they would flag on both. And in my experience in assessing students in the area of writing, in the area of spelling, if they, if they struggled in that area, they also struggled with the basic reading skills. Um, that's not always the case. That's not a rule. That's just typically they go hand in hand. And so we felt like casting that net of reading um, the universal screening is going to get 
the majority of students into that pool of struggling where we can drill down to find the actual area and then teaching teachers how to address those issues. And many of our intervention programs that we reviewed address um, that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this is a question I'm going to actually uh, comment on before you respond. It's another question from Susan. Are there any reading intervention programs out there that have met all criteria in the review process? And I would say... Yes. Okay. You say that? Because what am I... Yes. Go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll I can follow up. Pull up. What's that? I'm sorry. I said go ahead. I'll follow up after you. No, you go ahead, and then I'll, I'll follow I up. I think it speaks to what, uh, what Kelly was saying, is that there's so much developmental variation in how kids' brains are wired that it's incredibly difficult because, well, for instance, today we also did not talk very much about rapid automatic naming. And um, the research is getting becoming more clear that those are actually probably, to some degree, some separate neural structures and neural pathways in the brain that are specific to issues with the underlying language processing issues related to rapid automatic naming. So I know that from just pragmatically from my practice that you will you can have a child who responds really well to Spire or really well to Wilson or really well to Barton or whatever the, whatever the approach is, the Orton-Gillingham approach, by the way, I, I put program and I, I've been told not to. I said it was supposed to be an approach. Yeah. But the uh, concept is, is that I don't think there's one size that fits all. I mean, you have to be, you have to, it's, it's like you said earlier, it's a continuous improvement issue where we have to continually to improve the supports that we give teachers and specialists in this area so that this uh, issue of art and science is something that it's addressed over ma many years period so that they become a master at what they do. And that means that there's going to be times where one program is going to work for a while and then it's then it's going to top out, and then we have to kind of reorganize and think. Okay, so now we've gotten the child to this level. What are the proper interventions for the next level? Because sometimes they're just not. I mean, they're just addressing different aspects of how the child's brain is wired. And I think that's what drove uh, Kelly is really big into um, uh, morphology and uh, I forget the name. Sorry, Kelly, I can't remember what the model is that you've been really focusing on lately, but it's like, it's a very additive and it's proven to be very, very powerful in her work with her kids. And it's kind of gone beyond mm -hmm. the base of what we understand to a much higher level. And, um, and we have to be conscious of that and understand that there's no one size fits all. And we have to understand that this is a process, but we're all in it together. And, you know, it's a matter of, of continuous improvement, I think. Yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying because that's exactly what I say um, often. When I came out, when I said yes to are there interventions that met in all areas of criteria, yes, they met in all areas that they um, have evidence that they intervene for. That doesn't mean right, 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 right. yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, for example, Scholastics Read 180, the next generation, they meet in fluency and comprehension, but they don't meet in phonics, right? Be because they're not a phonics intervention. And so they met all criteria across the board, um, but it's specific to those areas of need. So um, again, we're going to provide this, um, all the areas that we reviewed um, as a resource so that you'll be able to see which, which interventions met all criteria. Um, many interventions um, that are um, an approach, if you will, like Orton-Gillingham, often don't submit to these types of things because that's it. It is, a, it is a, an approach, right, mm -hmm. versus a program that is scripted. So, um, and some would say, oh, well, you know, we don't have all, all the pieces for that, so how can we say it meets the criteria? But again, it's, it's a approach, and it's an approach that's not just effective, effective at Tier 2 and Tier 3 and special ed intervention, it's an approach that's very effective at Tier 1 to making sure that not as many students need the intervention. So I would agree 100% with what you're saying. Um, and we're not all the way there yet, right? I mean, right. Right. we have a lot, a lot of work to do in this, in this area still. I mean, we're, you know, schools and districts in the state of Tennessee and everywhere pounding the pavement and how to improve all the time. So um, 
yeah, I appreciate your comments on that. Yeah, yeah it's a complicated situation. We get complicated brains. Well, yeah. right now we're we're we don't have any other questions in the pipe, and um, we're about uh, 15 minutes left. So. Uh, we have a lot of resources, so if someone would like to answer, ask another question, please do so. And in the interim, let us just kind of orient you to what we've provided as resources so that um, you feel like you've got some really significant takeaways. Um, I'm going to review the slides below in a second, but um, I really wanted to focus on the third bullet here. As I mentioned earlier, Ty and her team put together these really clean and tight uh, feedback forms for you know peer review process for intervention and the peer review screening instruments for K-12 reading, mathematics, and writing. And the link there will take you to a page that will allow you to download both of those in a, in a Word doc because if you're in a particular district and you need to tweak it a little bit, you'll have the foundation there and you'll be able to uh, tweak it as you need. But that to me is one of the best takeaways that, that Ty has provided today because they're just so clean and so tight and it's obviously a, a reflection of a, a ton of thinking about the uh, levels that she was talking about earlier today. So we thought that it would be useful also because we're not just talking about reading, we're also talking about math, that we just provide this to you. It's from the Learning Research and Development Center, University of Pittsburgh. And there are trajectories of learning for different aspects of math. So numbers and operations in base 10, uh, addition of subtraction. And if you take a close look at these, it's a beautiful breakdown of these very discrete skills that we can track in order to be very, very targeted with our interventions with the kids. We'll know exactly where they're at and where they need to be headed. So multiplication and division relationships, and again, I won't stop so you can go through these really quickly. I'll just make sure that you get them. They're in the slide deck, so we'll make sure everybody gets uh, access to the slide deck. You should have access, but if you have any problems, you're just going to email us and we're going to take care of you. Uh, learning for fractions, um, ratios and proportional relationships, obviously getting a little bit higher up the food chain in math. Um, this is the math domains and skills area doc that's similar to the one that you got for reading. And again, it's a wonderful uh, kind of a, a takeaway that you can take a look at the domain area, you can take a look at the definition, the associated deficit areas. It provides basically a language in a lot of ways to talk about um, what it is, how to define it, what the deficit areas are, and then therefore what to think about in terms of intervention focus. Um, and there's the one again as a slide at the, in the resources for reading. And then we have also, we didn't talk much today because I mean, really think that there's kind of like a, an amount of information you could absorb, but you want to you wanna take a minute, Ty, and just talk a little bit about this simple view of writing, just to kind of pique their interest a little bit. Yeah, just briefly. Um, so, so basically, the two areas, the lower level trans transcription skills and then the higher le level language processing, again, following that whole math um, format that we talked about earlier, you need both in order to have writing proficiency, right? So zero times zero would be zero, and zero times one would be zero. But you need both, right? Um, and, I, and honestly, um, you know, it really boils down to how we are teaching it and how we can use these areas in conjunction with the areas of reading to effectively teach the reading and the writing piece and use that phonological loop in order to um, move forward with students, um, which is why we speak to that multisensory approach so much. Um, this in itself would um, be a uh, a good topic of conversation and a lengthy um, webinar, so I'm not going to get into the um, writing process too much right now, but just knowing that each of these areas um, in conjunction with teaching the reading um, really is going to be the most effective approach for students um, to learn to read um, effectively. And a lot of people don't understand that they go hand in hand that way. Um, but this for example... Good. I'm sorry, excuse me. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, please. Just going to say, for example, you know, using 
the approach around Orrin Gillingham, most of the time during multisensory approaches, you're working from um, you're working from that approach of not only learning, you know, letters, sounds, but also writing, you know, at a both a both most basic level. Um, trying to the, the more that you implement both areas, the more that it's really going to stick for students. I guess we'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say I think it's a um, topic worthy of discussion about doing an hour long webinar to kind of drill down into this a little bit more because it's, yeah. it's something that we really kind of we focus so heavily on the phonological piece, but not enough on the other yeah. side. And we're getting Absolutely. to do that. So um, no other questions yet. We're about an hour and 50 minutes in. Um, so if that's, if that's all just a couple of things, of course, uh, this is going to be turned around to you as a recording, I'd say, in the next 48 hours or so. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me with, at my email address here with any kind of follow-up questions that you have or any thoughts that you have. And, and Ty and I would love to also hear about your ideas about what would be very valuable in terms of next steps for this whole process of you know, in, in implementing, develop, uh, implementing universal screening and understanding how to do a, uh, an assessment after the screening and then into the implementation of an intervention, intervention program and what comes next, what would be most valuable to you. So if you have some thoughts about that, please don't hesitate. Shoot me an email and we'll, we'll take it into consideration, figure out what we can do for you next time. That will be also as valuable. So uh, again, thank you very much, and a special thank you to Ty. I really appreciate your expertise, and I mean, it's really a it's it's an absolute delight to work with you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.